Um, we're going to cover a humongous topic in the time allotted, and I did notice that there's not time allowed for questions in general. So I just want to say that I will be outside afterwards. If anybody has anything they want to chat about, I'll hang around for a good long while, probably now till lunchtime. So um, hang on to your questions. Don't bother writing them down. I will be happy to talk in person. Now, let's see. That'll work. Usual disclosure, I'm not getting any money for any particular thing, and we're going to talk about all sorts of things that the FDA doesn't approve, but because so much of what, um, what is used in kids doesn't have FDA approval, and I think you just heard a little bit about the process of having every single product go through the FDA in this last talk, that you can kind of appreciate why. Now, we're going to start with a little baby talk, because pain with, with so many forms of EB starts right at birth. Um, this talk in general will be kind of an overview. I'm not going to be able to cover every single thing, every single scenario, every single treatment. Simply, that's an enormous volume of material. So we're going to touch on a few things. I've got a few things that, throughout this talk that I'll highlight because I think that they're particularly, um, particularly important. Um, one is to say that we're developing uh, pain care guidelines and they are on the cusp of publication. I just heard back from the editors of the journal that we've submitted to, and we should be able to clean that up and get that out. And actually, that will be sort of, that will be available to everybody. It's going to be on a, what we call an open access journal, I meaning anybody can get access to it. Um, so the really detailed version of this talk will be available hopefully relatively soon. So blisters and wounds, of course, start uh, in many cases right away. Um, and there are a couple of scenarios. One is the child who's then uh, is severe enough and ends up in the neonatal uh, intensive care unit or, or an intensive care nursery. Um, and the key there is to, for nurseries that are not familiar with this, to, to advocate that before dressing changes uh, happen that the analgesic is given ahead of time, however, it, whatever is chosen to be given, it should be in a calm, warm environment, which in a hospital is sometimes hard to find. But I think when you have a child that is so stimulated with what's going on, having external stimulation is not a good thing. Uh, the other is both at home as one prepares the nursery um, and as one looks around in the uh, hospital setting to make sure that things like uh, the, the uh, HVAC, the, the AC and so on, isn't blowing directly on the area where you're going to be working with the child. And that's something to keep up as, you're, as you get into the older ages and you're planning, well, our next house, you know, we're going to move into this apartment, we're going to move into this house, we're going to do dressing changes in this room. Look at things like the airflow, because there's nothing like having your wounds exposed and something blowing directly on it to make it feel worse. So, so those are some of the pain, it's pain management, but it's also sort of uh, renovation management uh, of the living environment. The analgesics or pain relievers uh, for infants are uh, a wide variety, many of which we're used to in older folks. So things like the non anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen and so on can be used in, in the little ones. Acetaminophen is probably most commonly used in the very youngest of the ones. Opioids like morphine and things related to it are perfectly fine. They have to be dosed properly and the kids have to be monitored carefully, especially when they're really little. Um, Sucrose, we're going to talk about for a moment, because that's something that is available to the babies that doesn't work for the rest of us, unless those of us who like get hooked on chocolate when we're, when we're a little bit older. Um, but that's something that can be uniquely useful without a lot of the side effects that you have to worry about with the other medications. And then ketamine's open for question. That's not something to be used at home, but is something that can be used in the hospital that has unique properties for pain management without having so many of the problems with, for instance, risking interfering with breathing. Although, like I said, any of these medications, especially of the, the more heavy duty, need to be done in an area, uh, in a situation where the kid be, can be monitored. Sugar pacifiers, just a word on, on the sugar. Um, this is good for the first few months of life, then it tends to be less useful. Um, basically, it's a couple mLs or a little less than half a teaspoon of a really concentrated sugar solution. Um, and then if you have the baby suck on a lubricated pacifier, um, that combination can be very soothing and will get you through at least minor pain. It's not good, at, you know, you're not going to have surgery with, with sugar.
but you may get through a, a minor dressing change or handling or a diaper change or something of that nature. It's not clear how often you can use it. If you use it 10 times a day, does it stop working? Um, if you use it once a week, I mean, nobody's quite sure. So it's a little bit of a hit and miss, but it is something that's unique to this age group. Now, obviously, the oral mucosa is the other area that in babies becomes a, a major area of, uh, potentially for pain. The Haberman feeder is a, is a specific uh, feeder that's designed, I think it was originally for cleft palate, but if it's well lubricated, is often better tolerated. But this, like everything else with EB and in general in life, is a bit of a hit or miss. So be prepared to insist that the nursery try different things. Be prepared when you get home to try different stuff. I mean, most of you know this. Most of you have older kids have already figured this out. But in welcoming new people into the community, into teaching the nurseries, these are some of the things that you can kind of advocate for. Now, growing pains, beyond the ones that we think about when the kids are actually growing, the number of different pain types, the sites, and the treatments change as people go through uh, life. So when they're little, when they're newborn, it's mostly acute type pain where it's taking care of um, a new blister or a new lesion in the mouth. It's trying to get them to eat, trying to do a diaper change specific situations where it hurts just then and there. That evolves. You keep those and you get recurrence of them, so it becomes recurrent pain, but chronic pain of a completely different sort can set in and gets treated differently. All of which can lead to a fair amount of anxiety. And we have to be careful and make sure that we address that. Because addressing the pain by itself is a good thing, but it's not enough. So we have to do what we need to do to make sure that anything that builds up and, and just really winds the kid up and makes them afraid, we want to take that on early and see if we can address the things, both pain and any other sort of fear, so that that cannot build on itself, because that will make people shut down. Anxiety is very, very underrated as a cause for making people miserable. So it's going to be a combination of acute medication, say right around bath time or right before surgery. Um, there are different ways to deliver it. It can be oral or G-tube. Things can be given nasally, although my experience in general with nasal midazolam or Versed is the brand name, is that you get away with that once because it burns. So save that one only if you really need it. But long term, as the child becomes old enough to work with a psychologist, that's not unreasonable. Um, antidepressants for the older children and then obviously into adulthood is very reasonable as well. It's not uncommon and again if anxiety is getting in the way and compounding the pain it's important to take care of it. Now acute pain comes in lots of flavors as you get older because once the kids get mobile they start falling down and whacking themselves and of course they get new lesions. The oral ulcers are going to come up just as they always had esophageal blistering, blistering and strictures uh, can come up in certain uh, types of EB. As the teeth come in and people are starting to chew more, dental pain and dental hygiene, of course, can be very, very difficult. So we have to make sure that that is addressed because you don't want an, uh, an abscess to be developing in the mouth because that's an easily fixable sort of pain. But it's something we have to, as providers, as well as supportive family members, keep in mind. Corneal erosions, watching the eyes, making sure that they kept protected and lubricated um, is more preventative of pain. But treatment of the corneal abrasions, patching used to be done and is no longer particularly recommended. There are non anti-inflammatory drops that can be used. Um, and obviously, keeping them moist and lubricated is a good thing. And acute pain, of course, is epitomized by surgical pain. And I have, will have something very specific to say about that. But as far as treatment, I want to bring up the most flexible group of medications that there are, and that's the opioids. And you can see it's a long list of things. The ones in red I'm going to talk about specifically because they're a little weird, and they have some specific ways that they can be used that are different from the rest. The column on the right is a long list of ways of giving these medications. And that's why I say these are extremely flexible. And one of the things that we, we as providers and you will, as advocates to the providers will have to bear in mind is that we need flexibility and that this group of medications does afford that to us. Now, when you have this many choices of wonderful potential things, such as in this sweet shop, um, how do you choose? How do you pick the right one? What's the right thing to do? 
Well, the first question you need to make sure you address with the provider is let them know what's worked before. That's what I tell my trainees. That's what I tell people on the, on the provider end who are supposed to be writing for these things and making these decisions. Ask the person, what did they use before? It doesn't have to start from scratch each time. So I would recommend when you're playing the, the role as an advocate for yourself or for a family or member or friend is to let them know, hey, this is what we've used before. This works best. On the other hand, it also means that this one makes me itch, makes me throw up, whatever it might be. Um, now, what's the context? A lot of times, if you need something short-acting, that's going to take you right away from using something that's long-acting, because it's just the wrong drug. So you take those right out of the equation. On the other hand, if there's an ongoing pain that would work, if you, work, the coverage of the pain would work better if you had something that's slowly released, then you would switch to that type. Then there's the question of, does it have to be a pill or a liquid? Because that's going to change which of these is actually available to you. Now, things to watch for. Combination medications hide a particular problem. Most of the combinations are with acetaminophen. Common brand name is probably Tylenol. So Tylenol with codeine. Um, the problem is that while the opioids can make you sleepy, you can overdose on them and that kind of thing, when they're dosed properly, those are generally not an issue at all. However, if you take several different ways, if you take several different types of acetaminophen or acetaminophen-containing products, you can run into severe liver toxicity. So one of the big things to say, if you need to watch for fever, use a type of, of opioid that is separate um, and made, well, it's made separately so you can take it without the acetaminophen. Take your acetaminophen just for the fever. If you've got cough and cold preparations or other things like that to take, look at the ingredient label, label and make sure that you've separated out the acetaminophen. Again, you don't want to stack that particular thing. So it's a little weird. I'm talking about something that everyone worries, worries about overdosing and addiction and all that and telling you about acetaminophen because that's actually most of the time can be more dangerous and that tends to be hidden because no one thinks of it. The other thing is some of the long-acting forms like the Oxycontin and the MS Contins of the world are made in slow-release pill form for a reason. These are slow-dissolved pills. They can't be crushed. All right, so they can't be chewed. Otherwise, they release everything all at once. You get a whole day's worth all at once. That's generally a bad thing, right? So if you have a G-tube and that's the only way to take it, then we're going to talk about a different long-acting medication that would be more appropriate. And that would be in this, the group that was marked in red before. Methadone is a long-acting medication. Uh, it's fairly potent. It should be provided pretty much by pain physicians because it's got some really peculiar things about it that need to be handled very carefully. But it comes as a crushable pill and it comes as a liquid. So for people who have a long-term pain um, where the decision between the provider and the patient is that this would be appropriate, this is an option for EB, whereas the other ones sometimes are not. Tramadol and Tepentadol, one's an older version and, and then a newer version of a similar medication, are a little unusual in that they're listed as opioids, but they have multiple effects outside of the typical opioid effect. And that can be very useful. They're a little less sedating. They're less constipating. Um, and I don't remember that Tepentadol comes as a liquid. I think Tramadol does. Butorphanol is interesting in that it actually will reverse some of the effects of a standard opioid. And in which case, um, that's good because it hits pain in a different way. And again, it tends to be non-constipating. A quick thing on biopsy pain, because when you have a lesion that needs to be looked at, there are things that the doctor can do to make the injection of the numbing medicine less painful warming it up, so body temperature injection is better than a cold injection, for instance. They can add a little bicarbonate to make the pH a little different. That helps. A thin needle is less painful than a fat needle. And that's something that, as, as we go along, we should, you should always remember. It's not the length of the needle that hurts. It's how fat it is. So a really skinny needle this long isn't going to hurt anywhere near as much as a fat needle this long. So don't worry when somebody pulls out the syringe that it looks long. If it's skinny, it's going to be OK. If it's fat, that's a problem. You should talk to them about using something skinnier. And injecting slowly allows the medicine to get into the tissues without rapidly expanding the tissues, and that hurts less, too. So there are a lot of technical things we can do to make a biopsy be a whole lot less painful. Now, pain after surgery. Here's the take-home message on this. We, as pain providers, can do everything for folks with EB that can be done for anybody else. 
Um, what you see here in the two pictures, one is a patient-controlled analgesia pump. It's a way of pressing a button and being able to give yourself a small amount of medicine within certain parameters so that you can control your own pain to a greater degree than relying on the nurse to go and get it for you. All right, that can be very, very useful. Anybody over about age seven can use it. So there's a wide range of folks that can use it. Some places will have it so that the parents can use it for littler kids. And I can't promise that every institution does that. Nerve blocks, as you can see the picture on the right, there's a little, you can see a little catheter, a little tubing going under the, the uh, Mepilex. That's a nerve catheter that's keeping his arm completely numb after surgery. So we can put those in. Um, I've gotten calls from places who say, I've got a lady, she's in labor. Can I put an epidural in because she's got EB? I said, well, how does the skin look over her back? He said, fine. I said, yes. But you need to use the minimal stick or the non-stick uh, dressings. I need to check them every day. But the take-home message is that pretty much if, you, if a person with EB has a surgery, we should be able to do just about everything that we do for everybody else. And that's an important thing to advocate to providers who may not realize that. Now, chronic pain becomes a little different. There are changes that happen in the nervous system when the air, an area has been pain, in pain for a long time. It becomes very sensitized. And we need to remember that medications don't do everything we need them to do. We need to add in mechanical treatments for mechanical pain. So if a joint is deformed because of the contractures. A medication is going to take the edge off, but if you're trying to walk on an ankle that's interned, it's going to hurt every time no matter what medicine we give you. Now, I can knock you out. You'll be pain free. But laying asleep on, on a bed somewhere in the hospital is not exactly having a life. But if we can support the ankle mechanically so that then it hurts less, the medications can then take the edge off. Now you can actually go out and do stuff but the medication by itself will be doomed to failure. And a lot of people really put a lot of stock and, and hope in medications. And then they're very frustrated. So I'm just laying that out there, that if it's a mechanical pain, we're often going to recommend mechanical fixes for the pain. Um, lots of things with orthotics, modification of shoes, and that kind of thing. We're going to have some, uh, talk a little bit about some topical analgesics. I know there's a talk on topicals later, and I don't know the content of that. So I will try not to do anything that, that might um, double, up, uh, double up the content. And then psychological treatments are really important. We're going to spend a moment on that. But non-traditional pain medications. We use antidepressants. Why? Because the transmission of pain goes along a number of different routes between the spinal cord and the brain. It's not just about treating the depression. There may be depression. It wouldn't be a shock to me. Anybody in you know, the chronic painful state is not always going to be happy. But those are often treated with more specific antidepression antidepressants. Some of these have chemical features that allow us to treat the pain pathways so that they suppress how rapidly the pain is transmitted and how well and, uh, or not it's being received in the brain. Anticonvulsants or anti-seizure medications also, they can decrease nerves that are overly sensitive. If you th and, and this is our only a rough um, explanation. But if you think of uh, seizures as coming from overly excited nerves within the brain, some of the same chemicals that can quiet those nerves can quiet overly excitable nerves within the spinal cord and thereby reduce some of the pain. Can't go through a pain talk without somebody asking a question about medical marijuana, so I'm just going to throw this out there and say that I don't know a whole lot about it. There haven't been any studies, and it's illegal in most states anyway. So this remains for the future. But I would look at it in the same way I look at herbs and medications. It's a tool to do a job. If it turns out it's been looked at, it's the right tool for the right job, that's great. But there's lots and lots of hype about this and about lots of other things that is completely unwarranted. It's the same thing like a, a, the evening commercials you see for one medication or another. It's wonderful. You're going to go dancing and you're going to do Tai Chi and you're going to do all these wonderful things, right? They're overcalling that. They're trying to sell what they're selling. Those medications are effective for groups of people, but they're not generally wonder drugs. Well, it's going to be the same thing with marijuana. It's going to be the same thing with herbs. So just bear in mind that there's going to be lots of talk about it. There's not going to be a lot of evidence, but we should treat it like a medication because that's essentially the role, the role that we're asking it to play. The other thing about herbs is that 
Because they can do one thing, they can do another, just like a medication. So they have side effects. Just because they're natural doesn't mean that they're safe, doesn't mean that they're free of interactions with existing medications. To the contrary, if you have someone who has easy bruising and bleeding, and we know the bleeding from, from wounds is, is a, a big problem for a lot of folks, taking an herb that keeps the platelets from clotting the blood well could be a big problem. So bear in mind that some of the things, these things do do what they, are, uh, what they say they do, whether it's relieving pain or helping sleep or whatnot, but they should be treated like medications and you should watch them carefully if you're gonna use them. A couple things on topical analgesics. Uh, lidocaine, it's a numbing medication, comes usually as a 2% jelly. For small lesions, can be, particularly painful lesions, can be useful. The downside is that lidocaine can be very toxic and if you slather a person in it, we don't know what the absorption is and you don't wanna end up having seizures or other problems. So we tend to be fairly careful and use it for very small lesions. Topical morphine is something that we've started using in the last couple of years, and this has shown a lot of potential. Um, we're going to be going back through our files on everybody that we've prescribed it for and get a sense for how, how well does this work, and then do, we're going to put together a, a real randomized controlled trial in the, probably in the next couple of years to really see is this as good as we suspect it might be. I picked this up based on some early literature on different kinds of ulcers where they were putting morphine gel and discovered that the amount they were taking by mouth, say of morphine, went way, way down. So we started using it uh, on particularly uh, painful lesions, and I'm really careful about how much I let people use because I have to calculate you know, what, what would it be if I gave it to them by mouth and try to guess how much they're absorbing and so on. So it's, it's a rough science. So again, we go kind of slowly with this too for safety's sake, but we've had a number of folks say that this has been very helpful. So this is something we're gonna be exploring more. Now, mind-body connection. This is why I said earlier that psychology is really worth talking about because it doesn't have side effects and it is totally relevant because if you look at, at this anatomic model where they basically pretend taking slices from the brain all the way down to the spinal cord, there are a lot of different areas that both transmit pain up but suppress pain. So you got those people, you know, the fire walkers and the people who lay on beds of nails and stuff like that. You wonder how they do that. It's got to hurt. Personally, I haven't tried it. It doesn't look like that much fun. But they can do it because they can harness the areas of the brain that suppress pain. We can all do that to a certain extent. We're not all going to be these gurus who can just put everything out of our heads. But we can learn to suppress some pain we can learn to tolerate certain discomfort. For instance, if we block out a certain part of our body because we are focused on something else, then that part of our body doesn't hurt. Let me make you all uncomfortable for a moment. You've all been sitting very nicely pretending to listen to me. <laughs> and I appreciate that. But how many of you aware, are aware of the fact that you've got a lot of pressure on your butt right? You've got sensation coming up your spinal cord saying, you've been sitting here for X amount of time listening to this lecture, I'm getting uncomfortable. As long as you've been focused on me or making really solid mental effort to, to try uh, or pretend, then you've not been receiving those signals even though they're there. So that's an example of how the brain can selectively filter out different sensations. You can do the same thing for more extreme pain, but it takes more practice. All right. And I'm going to cut through this, but <laughs> all right. If you, if you get a cut, and this is, it's, it's, a trivi it's trivial if you don't have EB, but if you get a paper cut, obviously with EB, it's a bigger deal. But if you're opening an overdue bill, that, that little injury, that little wound is a big deal. If you've just won a million dollars, that little injury is not a big deal at all, <laughs> right? So emotion and our thoughts have a huge amount to do with how much we feel and, ex and experience pain, because pain's an experience. It's a sensation, but it's much more than that. So we, when we treat pain, especially as the kids get old enough to start being able to participate in this, and certainly for adults, you can start harnessing these things that are already in, in the brain to suppress some of the pain. Our approach to pain makes a big difference too. If you've if you're telling yourself, I can't handle this, or I can't get through it, this is terrible, 
then it's going to be terrible, right? But if you say, you know, yeah, this kind of stinks, but I, I've done this before. I can do this again. It's not going to last forever. I'm going to get these bandages on. I'm going to get over this sprained ankle. I'm going to get through this headache. I'm going to, I'm going to get through this because it's not going to last forever. My, my medication is going to take the edge off, and I'm going to do my relaxation exercises and put my brain to work. And I'm going to be okay. You can have the exact same injury and experience it completely differently. So this is a lot of what our psychologists work on. We can do it through a variety of other different ways. People find their way. They can do yoga. They can do meditation. They can do a variety of things that helps them get to the point where they say, all right, I feel what I feel, but I'm going to be okay. Cognitive behavioral therapies is the sort of the fancy word for what we, what we ask uh, folks to see psychologists to work on. And you can hear a little bit more about that with a specific focus uh, from uh, Dr. Popenhagen, who's going to speak right after me. Biofeedback is a way of monitoring the body and putting it out there on a, basically on a computer screen or some other monitor so that you can see what's going on in your body and then learn to control it. This is a really nice way of learning to master your body, which is really helpful if you're in a situation where you feel helpless. Something's been done to you, whether it's having EB or falling down the stairs and breaking your leg or whatever it might be. But this is a way of saying, all right, this is my body. I'm going to use this computer technology to figure out how I can have some control back. Distraction's good, all right? We've all seen people be distracted and they seem like they're not having pain until you take their phone away. Right? And, and then they remember that they were uncomfortable. But again, it has to do with that mental focus that prevented you guys from knowing that your tushes were, were getting uncomfortable. If your brain is focused in a particular way, then you can shut out other things. I call it kind of a selective hearing for pain. Right? And if you ask my wife who's in the audience about selective hearing, I am the master. Um, my mother told me that a long time ago, too. But, um, Anyway, all these are, are different mental exercises that one can do to put the focus on the, of the brain on a particular thing that's not the pain and therefore have less mental space to process the pain. Adjunct therapies. People ask about acupuncture. Probably plus minus uh, in, in the EB population. I would say I have no objection to people trying it. People who do not have EB often find it very beneficial. The downside tends to be that it's cash on the barrel because insurance generally doesn't cover it. Um, I'm sure we've sort of gotten used to that for a lot of things. Um, yoga, meditation, again, more mind-body stuff can be very, very useful. What I tell folks as they get into the high school range is, hey, you may start some of these things for pain. You've taken up yoga. That's cool. Put it on your resume. It's a hobby. You may have started some of these mind-body techniques because they were good for your pain. They were good for your well-being. The rest of the world sees these as hobbies. So you might as well get credit when you apply to college or for a job or whatnot. You look like a well-rounded person. You do Tai Chi, you do yoga. Oh, you do some meditation. Well, that's cool. How long have you been doing it? Oh, I've been doing it all through high school. Wow, that's neat. You must be really good at it. Yeah, yeah, I really, you know, I guess I am. And you've got decent grades, and here you go with your job or your school or whatever it might be. All right. So I try to think of some practical ways to use some of this so that it's not just I have to go for therapy. It's, oh, I have a hobby. All right. Itching. All right, itching's a big deal. Uh, it's one of my gang of three. I already told you one of them. Itching, nausea, and anxiety tend to get poo-pooed. Eh, you, you scratch a little bit. You're a little nervous. You're not throwing up now. What do you mean you're nauseated? All right, these things can make people freaking miserable. So we got to take care of them. And I kind of talked about that with the anxiety. And you'll hear more about specific applications of anxiety management next. But in EB, of course, itching leads to scratching. Scratching can lead to worse wounds, more pain, infection. There are a number of ways to go at itching. Some of them have good track records. Some of them don't have track records at all yet. Some of them not such good track records. Keeping the skin moist, emollients can help. Topical steroids, the problem is, is absorption and then with the systemic effects. Um, bandages, wet wraps, things like that. Silk garments are sometimes more comfortable. Cooling, cool, counteracts 
the itch receptor as it processes through the spinal cord. So that's why when, when people get an itchy spot, they'll often put something co like a cold rag or, or, or an ice pack or something. There is a physiologic reason that that works. So, you know, the fans that so many people use to keep, to keep uh, cool, ice packs, cool, uh, self-cooled pillows and stuff like that, some people find useful. Back to psychology. Again, if it works for pain, it can work for itch. The one thing that's a little different is habit reversal. People don't usually have pain out of habit but they can get the scratching out of habit. We've seen lots of times where people have some itching for one reason or another, whether it's eczema or EB or some other reason. But when they get stressed, they scratch more. If we can undo that habit, then we've reduced that part of the itch scratch and therefore reduce the number of wounds that would come from it. Medications, people who come in to clinic usually having used, say, diphenhydramine, brand name Benadryl or, and others. Um, and they can be either sedating antihistamines or non-sedating, so some of them take it at bedtime because it helps them sleep. Others will take the non-sedating ones during the day so they can function. Um, some people find them very useful, but nobody exactly knows the cause of the itching and EB, and it's not just histamine. So taking an antihistamine may help some, but it doesn't have a great track record, and that's why. Not all itching is related to histamine. Opioids can make you itch. And that's one of those things that as you discuss opioids and choosing the right one, if you have one that really makes you itch, tell them, please don't give me that. Um, we're going to talk about a couple. I'm going to zip ahead just for time. Um, well, I should have just talked about that. Ondansetron. It's an anti-nausea medication, but some of itch, some of its physiology has to do with serotonin. So if you have a serotonin blocker, you may be able to um, block some of the itch. Tried it a few times. It's pretty non-toxic. Um, it is expensive, although it's usually covered. Some people have found that it's useful. So for those, we continue it, but other people have found it useless. I don't have an overall sense as to how good this is, but it will be something if you walk into, you know, if you'll come into clinic, I may recommend that we try it, because there's not a lot of downsides as long as you're not on other medications where inter interactions are an issue. Gabapentin we're using more and more. This is one of those anticonvulsants that I mentioned is also useful for pain. Part of the physiology of itch and the transmission is very similar to pain. So it stands to reason that why don't we try similar things for one that work for the other. So this is a low toxicity medication that can come as a liquid for those who need it and has a track record of being shown to work in post-burn itching. So as people recover from burns, they often get really itchy. And so this has been used for that, and it's been useful. Um, you can get side effects and even feeling suicidal on it, so it's one of those things we go carefully and we, we discuss that so that people can watch for mood, mood swings. Success has been variable, but largely positive. Um, it can be uh, put along with any other medications that has no interactions with other medications. It's one of the few medicines I can say that about. Um, so this will also be discussed if we've got itch that is not being helped by other things. Doxepin and amitriptyline are old-fashioned antidepressants. Same thing. Some of the same pathways that, are suppre that these suppress for pain or certain types of pain sometimes help with the itch. Doxepin is also an antihistamine or has antihistaminic properties. Therefore, and it makes people sleepy. Sorry, that's the third thing. So taking it at bedtime often will be helpful. Again, none of these are magic, but they all can be useful. So in conclusion, from birth onwards, there are a variety of different types of pain. They need to be dressed, addressed differently. So if it's bone pain, which we didn't talk about, then doing things like making sure you have vitamin D and good calcium supplementation to make sure that you don't have compression fractures is important. If it's wound pain, topical and systemic medications and psychological interventions are can be useful. And as we put together our best care practice guidelines for pain care, we discovered that the level of evidence is horrible. Very few studies have been done in EB Few studies have been done in anybody, to be honest, for a lot of this stuff. So research is really, really important for moving forward. Now I have a quick public service announcement before I turn the, the um, podium over. Uh, May We Help is an Ohio-based volunteer group comprised of uh, engineers. Um, engineering with a heart, as one person put it. They put together adaptive equipment, the modified bicycles, uh, handrails, um, as you can see, the, the gentleman here who's quadriplegic, can't use his arms and legs, but likes to paint. Um, 
my son and, and a senior engineer uh, built him a rig where he can paint with his mouth. All right. Um, they do all sorts of stuff and they will take on projects. Um, I said I would be available uh, and I will be available for questions and stuff outside for the next, you know, till lunchtime or so. Um, my son Benjamin, the handsome young man in the, the red shirt, is a volunteer um, with this organization and he'll hang out too. If anybody has um, questions about it, he's got some business cards. Um, they're a small group, they work hard, but if there's anything that they could, be, that they could help build or create, um, they would love to, to talk with you guys about that. And with that, I thank you very much. This is the painting that that went on to become, just for reference. It's hanging in, in Benjamin's bedroom. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here today. Thank you.